This documentary does not claim to be a work of science or religion. However, to understand the now widely accepted notion that aliens created humans as opposed to the more traditionally held view that we were all created by the God of established religions, an intense look at science, religion, history, and a host of other studies must be undertaken. Accordingly, this chapter begins with a brief lesson in paleoanthropology. I think it's one of the scars in our culture that we have too high an opinion of ourselves. We align ourselves with the angels instead of the higher primates. Angela Carter Paleoanthropology, the study of ancient humans, tells us that humanity's origins began in East Africa. No scientific study disputes this claim. In accordance with paleoanthropology, today's modern human family is not a direct Darwinian descendant of gorillas, orangutans, or chimpanzees, as many were once led to believe. Rather, paleoanthropology teaches we're direct descendants of a pre-human community known as Homo ergaster, also called Homo erectus. The pre-human Homo ergaster is one of the earliest relatives on our human family tree. Not fully like modern humans, Homo ergaster families were our grandparents. They stood around 6 feet 2 inches, and by contrast with modern humans, had low foreheads and small brains. They lived in eastern and southern Africa between 1.8 and 1.3 million years ago. The pre-human families to evolve from Homo ergaster were the Homo heidelbergensis, also called Heidelberg man. Named after Heidelberg University in Germany, the Heidelberg families were our parents, that is, our direct ancestors. They lived between 600,000 and 400,000 years ago. The interesting thing about our parents, the Heidelberg families, is this. They didn't only bring forth a modern human race, but they're also the parents of another human family a mysterious human family known in history as the Neanderthals. This is very interesting because of the mysteries and many questions that surround our older brothers and sisters, the Neanderthals. The biggest mystery may be why and how they became extinct some 30,000 years ago. We will find out the truth shortly concerning all the mysteries surrounding the Neanderthal families. Our older brothers and sisters, the Neanderthals, appeared on Earth in Eastern Africa some 350,000 years ago. Modern humans came much later than the Neanderthals. Our origins began around 200,000 years ago in Eastern Africa. The world of anthropology considers the evolution of modern humans an excellent evolution leap from our parents' Heidelberg gensis. But this is not the case with our older brothers and sisters, the Neanderthals. One of the mysteries surrounding the Neanderthal families is this. Why wasn't their evolution leap from Heidelberg gensis as promising or gifted as the modern human's leap? To understand why is to understand how evolution works. So, let's take a brief look into the mechanics of evolution. There's an old saying, rules are made to be broken. We observe the laws of nature as something concrete and unchanging. There are truly no laws in nature, only habits restricting us from moving beyond the barrier. It is as Ben Stewart once said, the illusion of a fixed law is the result of there being no need for that habit to be broken. Once a habit needs to be broken, especially to assure the survival of an organism. In many cases, the habit or law of nature is broken. When this occurs, we call it evolution. Let's take for an example, 
The John Current Experiment In 1988, a biologist named John Current did an experiment using lactose intolerant cells in an environment with only lactose for food. Under a concrete law of nature, every one of the lactose intolerant cells should have died. But amazingly, the cells all survived through evolution. It seemed that the lactose intolerant cells understood the problem they were faced with and adjusted by replacing the defective lactose enzymes with functioning ones to utilize lactose for food. In a nutshell, when these cells were faced with extinction, they broke their habit of being lactose intolerant by bringing forth functioning enzymes compatible with lactose to combat and break the law of nature. This evolutional process doesn't only happen on the scale of cellular life, it happens on all scales of biological life because all biological life is made up of cells. Evolution is defined, the process of continuous change from a lower, simpler, or worse to a higher, more complex, or better state. Keep that definition in mind as we venture deeper with our observation into evolution. To comprehend precisely what occurred hundreds of thousands of years ago with the Anunnaki alien astronauts who had their involvement in bringing forth humans, an in-depth look into evolution is necessary. Therefore, let us now briefly dive into the evolution of organisms. Morphogenesis and Organisms May the reader understand, evolution is propelled by what is termed in science, morphogenesis. Morphogenesis is the biological process that causes all organisms on the planet to develop their shapes. Note, when we think of an organism, we tend to only think of it on a small scale, cellular life, bacteria, DNA, etc. But we shouldn't distinguish organisms by size, but rather by functionality. An organism is defined this way. Any contiguous living system. Organisms vary from fungus to cells to plants and even animals. The Earth's electric generation. What causes morphogenesis is the Earth's electric generation. In much the same way utility companies distribute energy to its consumers. The Earth possesses its own electric generation with a resident frequency production, which is determined by the Earth's circumference, diameter, speed of rotation, and orbit around the Sun. Understand. It is the Earth's electric generation that causes your smartphone, television, and laptop to function. And it is the same force generated by the Earth, along with mitochondria turbines inside of your trillions upon trillions of cells that causes you to function as a human, walk, talk, grow, think, etc. Just because your smartphone was an invention, do not think for a moment that the force which causes it to function was an invention. On the contrary, electricity was a discovery, not an invention. Electricity is defined, a fundamental form of energy, observable in positive and negative forms, that occurs naturally as in lightning, or is produced as in a generator. Electricity, Webster's Dictionary. The phenomenon of electricity we experience daily is associated with the flow of an electrically charged Earth. Just as you see the effects of the Earth's electric generation through your functioning smartphone, the effects of the Earth's electric generation can also be seen naturally in things like static electricity, lightning, and electric current. We know, the ancient Egyptians were aware of the Earth's electric generation through some of Earth's living creatures. There are ancient Egyptian texts dating back to as early as 2750 BC that refer to electric fish in the Nile River. The ancient Egyptians named those fish, Thunder of the Nile. Much later in 1791 AD, physician and physicist Luigi Galvani published his discovery on bioelectricity where he demonstrated that electricity was the medium by which our nerve cells passed signals to our muscles. Over the last 150 years, many great men like Nikola Tesla, 
Galilea Ferraris, and Thomas Edison learned to harness the Earth's electric generation, and by doing so, a multitude of inventions were brought forth. Our Ecosystem The Earth's electric generation governs what is termed in biology, the ecosystem. Our ecosystem is the community of all living organisms on Earth, microbes, plants, insects, and animals working in conjunction with the non-living components of their environment, air, water, and mineral soil interacting as one system working together in unison. All living organisms on Earth are linked together through the Earth's electric generation. The electric generation results in an electromagnetic field that envelopes the outer core of the Earth. This electric field is no secret to the scientific community. The field shields humanity from harmful sun radiation storms. What causes this electromagnetic field to surround the Earth is the Earth's liquid iron core, which spins at a tremendously rapid pace, producing this electromagnetic field that surrounds the Earth and affects all biological life on the planet. Over the years, we have learned how to tap into and manipulate this field, bringing about the electrically driven world of technology we live in today. To find out more about the Earth's electric generation and humanity's oneness with it, Research the Global Consciousness Project launched in the 1990s by retired Princeton University professor, Roger Nelson. The Working Phenomenon of Electricity If you are wondering how the electric field surrounding the Earth works in biological life, you must understand that frequencies from the Earth's electric generation are picked up by plant life through what is termed flora. The same frequencies are picked up by animal life through what is termed fauna. The fauna works as a conduit allowing the Earth's electrical wave patterns to enter the creature's brain and reverberate or echo. By this, each individual cell in the creature's body receives an electric magnetic impulse from the creature's central nervous system, that is, the brain and spinal cord. These wave patterns distributed by the Earth's electric generation are the cause of many human behaviors such as the woman's menstrual cycle and all animal life circadian cycles. It is imperative to understand morphogenesis in the Earth's electric generation when trying to comprehend how evolution works in biological life. The evolutionary leaps of the Earth's organisms are not simple, but rather, very complex procedures brought about by many different faculties, with the Earth's electric generation being key. All biological life on Earth works together in a systematic order due to this electric generation distribution of the Earth. It is a force that the ancients called the consciousness or logos of the planet. Forming, shaping, and revolutionizing every living organism. This logos or consciousness of the planet is actually what was mentioned earlier. The liquid iron that makes up the core of the planet, spinning at a very high velocity, creating magnetism, an electric field extending from the core of the Earth and surrounding the entire planet. This electric field governs our thoughts, movements, and evolution. This is seen in the excellent evolutionary leap of the modern human from our parents, Heidelberg Gensis. In much the same way, every 7 to 10 years, the average American buys a new car. A car more comfortable and technically better equipped to handle the road and the changing world. 
so it is with evolution through the Earth's electric generation. The Earth provides all its living organisms with suitable equipment and maintenance to keep up with a changing world. But this makes one wonder, what happened with our brothers and sisters, the Neanderthals? Why was our evolutionary leap from our parents so high-tech, and theirs from the same parents so dramatically flawed? This mystery will be unveiled with the unfolding of this documentary. Comparing Neanderthal humans and modern humans. The science of anthropology along with genetic testing tells us, 350,000 years ago Heidelberg Gensis evolved into the Neanderthal families. Then, some 150,000 years later, the Heidelberg Gensis that remained in Africa evolved again, this time into modern humans. There is a 150,000 year gap in between the two evolutionary leaps. Some would say, Timing had much to do with the dramatic differences between the two families that evolved from Heidelberg man. But if timing was a factor, one would still have to wonder why the two families, Neanderthal humans and modern humans, evolved on two separate occasions. As mentioned earlier, the leap into the modern human family is considered by science a leap of excellence because our bodies seem to be made for the world around us. what is termed in mathematics the golden ratio, a mathematical equation that can be observed throughout nature in pine cones, sunflowers, snails, and a host of other components of nature, is found literally from head to toe in the ideal modern human body form, in the face, in the arms, in the legs, hands, toes, teeth, bronchial tubes, and even in the measuring of DNA, this golden ratio can be found. Great artists like Leonardo da Vinci use the golden ratio in their art to illustrate realness. Also, the human body proportioned according to the golden ratio is taken as the basis of a book titled New Fert, Architects Data, arguably the most important reference book for modern-day architectural designing. But although this golden ratio is seen in the modern human body today, as well as in modern human fossils from ancient times, amazingly, this so-called sacred ratio is not present in the assemblage of ancient Neanderthal fossils found over the centuries. The leap into the Neanderthal family is viewed by science as a disaster. This flawed leap may have helped lead to their extinction some 30,000 years ago, although their leap was advanced in some ways beyond their precursors. As these evolution leaps are supposed to demonstrate, the Neanderthal families didn't seem to be built for the world ahead like the modern human families were. For example, Neanderthal legs were too short for running with speed, a characteristic that should have genetically evolved well, as it did in the modern human leap. The Neanderthals ran much slower than their precursors the Heidelberg man. Also, their chests were extremely wide, as if they were built for strength and even hard labor. They also possessed a tiny pelvis. These characteristics are considered character defects in comparison with modern human. In other words, the Neanderthal's evolutionary leap from Heidelberg gensis was not consistent with successful evolution. Although the Neanderthal's brain was bigger than their precursors, around the same size as the modern human brain, we can learn from Neanderthals that size doesn't always matter. Their thinking ability, at least as far as tool making was concerned, wasn't very promising. Modern humans matched their tool making techniques in less than 50,000 years of existence, something which took the Neanderthals 250,000 years. Inevitably, modern human families advanced far beyond them in the next 50,000 years of coexistence. Neanderthal tool-making techniques for hunting and survival didn't develop until the last 2,000 to 3,000 years of their existence. 
This is when they coexisted in Europe with a certain sect of modern humans known in history as Cro-Magnon Man. What could have stunted the Neanderthal's growth during their 350,000 years of existence? What could have stunted their growth to the point that their language wouldn't even develop in a normal manner? To solve these mysteries, one must investigate what some consider a branch of science known as pseudoscience, which speaks of ancient alien astronauts that visited the Earth in prehistoric times. When linking anthropology with pseudoscience, many mysterious questions are clearly answered. An Ancient Tale In 1849, British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard discovered 22,000 ancient Sumerian clay tablets in the ancient city of Nineveh, modern-day Iraq. The tablets contained an ancient cuneiform script, the oldest written language ever uncovered, dating back around 6,000 years. In some of these tablets was the Babylon legend of the Enum Morales. Author and scholar Zachariah Sitchin spent over 30 years studying and translating these clay tablets. He claims the tablets tell a tale long lost to us of how a race of alien astronaut scientists named the Anunnaki came to Earth some 400,000 years ago in search of gold, a substance very rare on their home planet, Nibiru. The gold these alien astronaut scientists were sent to find was to be retrieved from Earth, refined into a powder-like substance, and placed into the atmosphere of their planet Nibiru to work as a protector for the planet's diminishing atmosphere. As Zachariah Sitchin tells it, Upon arrival, the alien astronaut scientists tried to abstract the much-needed gold from what we now know as the Persian Gulf. When this failed, they resorted to mining gold in a part of the Earth the aliens called Abzu, which is modern-day Africa. But the work was too strenuous and the workers, that is, the alien astronauts, rebelled on the task. A leader of the Anunnaki a scientist named Inki decided to take the hominidae, that is, pre-humans in Abzu, alter their DNA, and bring forth a race of slave laborers to mine the gold in their steed. According to this ancient tale, the Anunnaki aliens arrived on Earth around 400,000 years ago. This was during the time of the existence of our parent ancestors, Heidelberg Gensis. The Sumerian Tablets and Religion The amazing thing about this archaeological find of Laird's is this. The cuneiform text found on the clay tablets give a narrative like many of the oldest stories found in the Bible. The story of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden are found in the cuneiform literature of these tablets, where Adam is addressed as the Adamu, while Eden is called Eden. The ancient Sumerian tale also gives reference to the old biblical stories, Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel. Because these tablets are thousands of years older than the Bible, it has led many notable scholars, both religious and secular, to conclude that the biblical stories found in the Bible's book of Genesis did not originate with the Hebrews, but was taken from the epics of this earlier ancient Sumerian culture. The Tablets and Astronomy Probably the most astounding thing concerning these ancient tablets is the text and drawings found within them illustrating our solar system. Many people take these ancient cuneiform writings left by the ancient Sumerians as gospel truth because of the detailed information the Sumerians wrote about concerning our solar system. There are things written on the ancient clay tablets referencing our solar system we have only found recently through modern scientific methods. From these ancient writings we know without a shadow of a doubt. The ancient Sumerians were very much at home with astronomy. The fact that these tablets date back 6,000 years tells us ancient man knew about the existence of planets long before we previously thought. 
Some of the planets the ancient Sumer people knew about, we have only discovered in the past couple centuries. Take the planets Neptune and Uranus for examples. They were discovered in 1781 and 1846. The ancient Sumerians wrote about these two planets in detail. They also wrote about Pluto, which was discovered by modern science in 1930. Within the lines of the cuneiform written tablets, the ancient Sumerians explain, it was the Anunnaki who gave them this detailed information about the solar system. As mentioned earlier, author Zacharias Sitchin spent well over 30 years examining and translating the cuneiform text the ancient Sumerians left. He explains the epic of the Anunnaki and their dealings with planet Earth in his book, The Lost Book of Inki. In translating the ancient tale, he writes, In the councils of the learned, to heal the breach of Nibiru's atmosphere there were two suggestions. One was to use a metal, gold was its name. On Nibiru it was greatly rare. Within the hammered bracelet, Earth's solar system, it was abundant. It was the only substance that to the finest powder could be ground. Lofted high to heaven, suspended it could remain. Thus, with replenishments, the breach it would heal, protection make better. Let celestial boats be built, let a celestial fleet, the gold, to Nibiru bring over. After arriving on Earth, the head scientist, Enki, and the rest of the Anunnaki couldn't abstract the gold from the waters of the Persian Gulf. So, they pursued another plan. In his translation of the ancient Sumerian tablets, Zechariah Sitchin writes, A solution is possible. Enki was saying, Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over, let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki, carry on his back. Astounded were the besieged leaders, speechless indeed they were. Whoever heard of a being a fresh created, a worker who the Anunnaki's work can do? They summoned Ninma, Inki's sister, and chief surgeon, one who of healing and succor was much knowing. Inki's words to her they repeated, Whoever of such a thing heard, the task is unheard of. She to Inki said, All beings from a seed have descended, one being from another, against eons did develop. None from nothing ever came. How right you are my sister. Inki said, smiling, A secret of the Abzu, let me to you all reveal. The being that we need, it already exists. All that we have to do is put on it the mark of our essence, thereby a Lulu, a primitive worker, shall be created. So did Inki, to them say, Let us hereby a decision make, a blessing to my plan give, to create a primitive worker, by the mark of our essence to fashion him. Thus did Inki to them a secret of the Abzu reveal. With astonishment did the other leaders Inki's words hear, by the words they were fascinated. Creatures in the Abzu there are, that walk erect on two legs, their forelegs they use as arms, with hands they are provided. Among the animals of the steppe they live. They know not dressing in garments. The leaders to Inki's words with amazement listened. No creature like that has ever in the Eden been seen. In Lil, disbelieving, said, Eons ago, on Nibiru, our predecessors like that might have been. It is a being, not a creature. To behold it must be a thrill. Ninma was saying, to the house of life Inki led them. In strong cages there were some of the beings. At the sight of Inki and the others they jumped up. With fists on the cage bars they were beating. They were grunting and snorting. No words were they speaking. Male and female they are. Inki was saying. Malehoods and femalehoods, they have like us, they are procreating. Ninja Siddha, my son, their fashioning essence has tested, akin to ours it is, like two serpents it is entwined. When they're with us, our life essence shall be combined, our mark upon them shall be, a primitive worker shall be created. Our commands will he understand, our tools he will handle, the toil and the excavations he shall perform, to the Anunnaki and the Abzu, relief shall come. The Anunnaki and the Neanderthals If the tale told by the ancient Sumerians is true, this sheds light on the mysteries surrounding our brothers and sisters, the Neanderthals. In accordance with the ancient Sumerian story, the primates the Anunnaki apprehended from Abzu, modern day Africa, some 400,000 years ago were of the Heidelberg families. And the slaves the Anunnaki fashioned were Neanderthal humans.
Many people believe and teach the race of slaves the Anunnaki aliens brought forth were the modern human families, but I beg to differ. According to genetic testing, science has established that modern humans sprung forth some 200,000 years ago. The ancient tablets concur the Anunnaki aliens were here some 400,000 years ago bringing forth their race of slave labor. I conclude, the race of slave workers these aliens fashioned must have been the Neanderthals, confirmed by genetic testing as coming into existence between 350,000 and 400,000 years ago. This was around the same time the Anunnaki aliens are supposed to have arrived on Earth. The tampering with Heidelberg man's DNA to bring forth slave labor may have brought about this evolutionary leap and dramatic flaws we find in Neanderthal fossils. We know from the Anunnaki epic told by Zachariah Sitchin that these aliens had not yet mastered a genome-altering procedure. The epic explains it was through trial and error that they finally brought forth their slave worker. I believe the alien astronaut scientists would not have mastered the genome because of the complexity of the human genome code. It is still far beyond modern human comprehension even today in 2023. I can only imagine the intricacy involved in altering pre-human DNA. Without the aid of a computer, it took four years for two-time Nobel Prize winner Fred Sanger of Cambridge University to crack the 5,000-letter DNA code of a basic virus. I imagine altering DNA-coded sequences to bring about a completely new creature would be an extremely hard and tedious task. This is why I believe the golden ratio was not present in our brothers and sisters, the Neanderthals. The golden ratio is an equation found throughout nature. But I would assume the so-called sacred equation would only be found in parts of nature that have not been tampered with and altered. In tampering with the Heidelberg families to bring forth the Neanderthal slave, what we find in the fossil records of the Neanderthals are legs that are too short to run with great speeds and an assortment of other flaws. Traditional science would argue that it was the harsh environment of European mountains that brought about these dramatic flaws in the evolution of the Neanderthals. But I would beg to differ because Neanderthals did not only live in Europe. Over the years, Neanderthal fossils have been excavated in the Middle East and Africa. In every place Neanderthal fossils are found, these same defects are present. Furthermore, the prehistoric modern man anthropology calls Cro-Magnon lived in Europe, even alongside Neanderthals for approximately 5,000 years. The only thing that was physically altered with Cro-Magnon men living in the harsh Europe environment was the pigmentation of their skin due to a lack of vitamin D from the sun. Although it sounds exciting and thrilling that humans living today may have their genesis in the hands of aliens from out of space, the notion becomes clearly unlikely when considering the evidence found in DNA research. Some 50 years ago before genetic testing had been developed, when these notions of alien origins were first put forth, all we had was the ancient Sumerian tale to fuel the notion of our origin of alien design. Back then the notion of our ancestors being created by aliens was an easy pill for the free-thinking man and woman to swallow. But considering recent genetic studies dealing with timelines markers and ancient fossils, one would have to conclude. If the aliens in the Anunnaki epoch did create humans, the humans they created had to have been the Neanderthal humans. As mentioned earlier, Modern humans did not come along until 150,000 years after the creation of the Anunnaki's Adam Mu, that is, first human mentioned in the ancient Sumerian cuneiform text. Concerning the morality principle of the aliens that fashioned the Neanderthal humans, we have no reason to think the Anunnaki were virtuous aliens interested in the longevity of their slaves. We have no reason to believe they were interested in their slaves' homeostasis with Earth's morphogenesis and electric generation. We know from the tablets left by the ancient Sumerians that the Anunnaki aliens were selfish, ambitious, and bent on power, control, and status. With these characteristics in mind, there is reason to believe the Anunnaki would have altered Heidelberg man's DNA in such a way as to bring about the perfect slave and nothing more. Another thing to consider is this. The defects found in Neanderthal fossils were probably fixed into their genome by the Anunnaki to keep them from rebelling. The broad chests of the Neanderthals, which appear to be fashioned for sheer strength, 
were probably installed for the purposes of labor. Another thing to consider is this. The characteristics of the Anunnaki, ambition, and status-seeking, may have funneled down to their slave creation. The Anunnaki epic tells us the alien slave labor force would possess their alien mark, the mark of their DNA, and as mentioned above, we find from the ancient Sumerian cuneiform literature that these aliens were controlling, ambitious, and bent on achieving and maintaining status and power. Although these same characteristics are seen all around us today, we don't find evidence of these characteristics in the modern human records until Cro-Magnon man brought them to the world once leaving the mountains of Europe. After living side by side with Neanderthals for 5,000 years, 